What's up, y'all? It's your girl, Jay Renee, with Prison Ride Radio. I hope that you're doing well. Um, this afternoon, we have a woman on the phone that wants to talk about some of the experiences she had when she was incarcerated and some, and talk about the experiences of the women that are still in this facility. Hello, you there? Yes. All right. Thank you for being able to record with us. And, you know, talk to us about what's going on. For For sure. You're most definitely. Um, So we're going to jump right into it. So um, what facility was it that you served your time at? I was at uh, Lauderdale County Detention Facility in uh, Meridian, Mississippi. Okay, in Mississippi. And uh, what was the time (laughs) frame of your incarceration? Um, September 2021 until December 2021. Okay. So, um, I know when we were speaking, we were talking about, you know, the response to COVID in that particular facility. What was, um, what was the PPE response at the facility when you were there? Well, um, I know I told you that I came from a state up North when I was locked up in Mississippi, Mm -hmm. but, um, you know, and up North, the PPE stuff in, uh, jails there are a lot more in guideline with what we should be doing mm-hmm. by the CDC. When I got to Mississippi, I had already had a mask on. It was a cloth mask, and um, I was told to take that off, that I couldn't bring anything into the facility, which is fine. So I asked for, you know, their issued um, face mask, and they gave me a blue one. But when I was doing my... Um, You know how they do like a nurse's check just to see like if you had any medical conditions or whatever. Mm -hmm. They had asked me if I had uh, if I had received my shots to which I said I did. But it was just a verbal yes. Like I didn't I didn't have the proof to prove anyways because I didn't have it on me. Mm -hmm. But they didn't ask for that either. And so anyone could have said that they had their shots and they didn't. Um, And then they asked me if I had covid uh, if I currently had COVID, um, and I said no. And again, they didn't do anything to check that, no temperature, no nothing. Wow. And so then um, I was thrown into the zone, into general population. Um, when I got to the door of the zone to get into the, uh, the pod that I was staying in, um, they told me to take the mask off. And I said, but I know how... Mississippi doesn't believe in COVID in general. Right. So I'm concerned that I'm going to have somebody else who has it give it to me. And I am, you know, not in a medical condition to be able to have that. I'm a high risk. Mm-hmm. So they said, you will not wear masks in this facility. Right. And I was concerned because, you know, I come from a, a, I come from a state where that's taken very seriously. And um, there was no precautions from that point on. Wow. Yeah, COVID is definitely very serious. So I can understand your concern. And I'm sure, you know, most everyone can understand that same concern. Um, One of the things that they tell us to do is not only to social distance six feet, which is already hard to do in a facility like that, but it's to wear, you know, a face covering. So them asking you to remove it is definitely alarming for, you know, lack of a better word. Yes, I, and that that concerned me. But at the time, you know, I had I had my mask. It was in my room, right. my cell, whatever. But I couldn't wear it out into the day room. They wouldn't let me wear it into the day room. And there was no – so in my state, there is a quarantine period of 10 days when mm-hmm. you get – it's funny because when you're in, like, the whole – like, the – when you first get into the facility in my town, my city um, – you have to stay in like the holding tanks with people. And my mm. my whole time was four days. So I'm with people who I don't know if they're COVID positive or not. If they got their shots or not. I don't know. But they gave us a mask at the very least. You know, and right. I know that that's not 100% prevention because people still you know, cough in their hands or whatnot. Mm. And you're sharing communal spaces as well as bathrooms with the same people, mm. you know, that you don't know if they're infected or not. Yeah, that's But after hard. that, shortly after that, they did quarantine me for 10 days. Okay. I was in a, cell, uh, in a cell by myself. And we had um, things to clean, our, to clean our spaces with, to clean the phones with in, that, in my city's jail. 
Um, but when I went to Meridian, that, that wasn't even a thing. The phones were never cleaned. I think I, in the three months I was there, they were cleaned one time. Mm. Um, we had a communal bathroom for uh, up to 30 women. It was between 18 and 30 at any point. We had a communal bathroom, and they never cleaned it but one time in the three months that I was there. And and that communal bathroom was only for when we were in the day room. I mean, we had bathrooms in ourselves. Mm. So, But, you know, five hours out in the day room, no, nothing clean. Not only COVID, but women. a lot of women had hepatitis A. I don't mm. have hepatitis A. So I had a whole... You know, hold going to the bathroom until I got back to my cell because right, right. I didn't want to get sick while I was there. Like you shouldn't have to go to jail and get sick. Yeah, <laughs> and that definitely. should be something that they understand. There's a pandemic going on a national, uh, in a global pandemic, right. and they're not. They, it seemed to me like they could care less. So, did, so or they couldn't care less. Did a lot of people get sick? While I was there, surprisingly, no, because we had people coming in, Mm -hmm. you know, transient, a lot of transient people came in. So I don't know who, I'm not saying that people who are homeless or in between houses are people who carry COVID because we're all susceptible to COVID. But like the more you're out in public, the higher the chances are that you'll have, you'll get it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so there were a lot of transient people that came in and they came in straight from the street. And a lot of them said that they would say that they were, they had their shots or that they were negative just to be able to come into Gen Pop because towards the end of my stay, they did form a dorm, B3, where they would put COVID positive people in. Mm-hmm. Although I only heard of one person being put in there. And that was like the week before I left. So, okay. I mean, I, I don't know. You know, while I was there, that was it. But after I left, you know, I kept in touch with women that were there, some mm-hmm. women, and everyone in the unit was sick wow. in B2. And the reason that they got sick was because a lieutenant came in positive, and she was out for two weeks. Right. All uh, the women, the female population, and then B1, I guess, it carries a lot of men. Mm-hmm. Um, they were sick as well. B3 is a COVID positive unit. They were sick as well, but they're trying to say that it was. It was people who are incarcerated talking between doors that got everybody sick. Well, you know, so, that area is like, it's a sustained area. So things have to be brought into it to disrupt it. You know what I mean? So the prisoners didn't just right. spontaneously become sick. It was brought into the facility, like you said, from this person right. that came up positive. So they're uh-huh. trying to say that it's being spread or not say that again you said how they're talking. they're trying to say it was exchanged between people who are incarcerated there uh-huh. so one that b3 unit b3 uh got unit b2 sick and unit b2 got b1 or b you know it was exchanged right. between them somehow because there's a door between each unit that people talk to or communicate through but um I'm not so sure that that's the truth because what I was hearing from people that I used to be in there with, they were saying that a lieutenant came in weeks before everybody else was sick uh-huh. with it. Right. So I don't really know. All I know is that it wasn't contained. It wasn't. It spread quickly because there is no PPE there. Right. They didn't um, clean the rooms. Like we, I don't know if you're everybody that's listening is familiar with what a cell to cell is, but they would go to each cell, clean it out. You know, they would bring bleach and um, comet and a broom and a mop and ask everybody to clean their dorms. I kept my uh, their dorms, their cells. I kept my cell clean because I'm not a dirty person. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I used what I had to keep it clean. I didn't have bleach. I didn't have comet. But you know, I had soap and things like that that I could use on my own to keep my room clean because it's very dirty in those facilities. It's disgusting, actually, and no one should have to live like that. But they never came by with the cell to cell thing. In the three months I was there, maybe three times. I know mm-hmm. two times for sure, possibly three times. Um, so in three months, you get to clean your, your cell once a month. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really nasty. And also, they, we would get to clean the day room once every two weeks. Mm-hmm. And really, we had to use our own, we had to use, we had to use toilet paper our own toilet paper to clean the tables down. They didn't give us paper towels or things like that. It wasn't until towards the end of me being there that they started bringing in bleach and paper towels and cleaner disinfectant to clean those spaces. But we would do it ourselves. They'd bring a mop and a broom in and we would clean the dorm. We would clean the zone ourselves, which is fine because we were bored. 
we wanted to keep it clean. Right. But there was no support for that. So. Right. And that's something that they're yeah. supposed to be doing because they get money from the government for that type of stuff. So for you to have yes. lack of supplies makes me wonder if you aren't spending the money where it's supposed to go, where is it going, you know? And it's funny you say that because B1 was full of men and they constantly were able, they were given things to clean their space with. The women are forgotten. Mm. And I'm not saying that because I'm a woman. or I'm not saying that because I feel like that would help my plight or other women's plight is 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 the truth. Yeah. We would leave the, the zone. We would go outside for outside rec or whatever. Come back in, and the jail smelled like bleach. It smelled clean. We pass by the men's dorm. It smelled clean. We go into our dorm, um, and it smelled like sewer. And I would ask them, why does it why does it always smell like sewer? And it smelled foul, like a dirty bathroom is what it always smelled like. Why is it so gross in here? Like you you became desensitized to that smell because you because you're in there all the time. But they would say, oh, it's just a sewer, or but they never came to help us clean. They never mm-hmm. let us clean. So any efforts to clean were were on us to use our personal or whatever state issue we had, and then we wouldn't be able to repl- replenish that because it was state issued. Wow. You know, so yeah. So what's going on in, in there now from what you've heard? Do you know what's going on? Um, yes. Um, so I just spoke with my former Sally, and she said that everybody was sick. Um, even a woman in a wheelchair, she was sick with COVID. Mm. Um, her family was able to pull her out, which I'm grateful for. I don't know the conditions of why she was there. I just know that she's not there anymore. Okay. Um, there are several people with mental health issues. I think there's like five people with mental health issues that are so severe, and they also are getting sick. So this, the thing, the reason why I mention that is because they're in suicide precautions, meaning most people know a turtle suit. Mm-hmm. Turtle suit is a the wool gown that they wear, so they can't tear it and they can't hang themselves or right. you do anything to harm themselves if they're feeling suicidal. So these people don't get a shower every day. If they are COVID positive, they don't even have running water. They have to, they're supposed to be going to their doors, to their cells every day and getting them out to get a shower. Mm -hmm. And that's not happening for these people who literally have no ability to understand or regulate their feelings, emotions, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of them don't even have support outside. So... And these people are being forgotten and they shouldn't be in jail. That's what I was told when I first got there. I was like, there's a man over there talking to himself. It looks like he might have some serious mental health issues. What is he doing in jail? And they're like, well, sometimes when the jail is over full, they bring, I mean, when the mental health place is over full, they bring them to this jail. And I said, jail is not equivalent to mental health help. Right. Right. That didn't make sense to me, but they said that's what happens all the time. So I'm questioning like, should these people with severe mental health issues be in jail? Mm-hmm. Unless they have criminal charges and the criminal charges are not about their mental health, like Mississippi needs to do better. Yeah, I agree with you. They definitely do need to do better. So um, let me ask you this. What kind of support do the, you know, the ladies need there now? How, could, so how can our listeners uh, assist in what's going on there? Well, I mean, they could call... I mean, if they wanted to call Lauderdale County uh, Detention Facility, they could. I okay. request that um, the space is sanitized every day because it needs to be sanitized every day, that there is something to clean the phones with between each call, that uh, it not give them ibuprofen. I heard that yesterday or maybe two days ago that they're, be given, they're given ibuprofen. I told myself, my former Sally, don't take ibuprofen. It's not good for COVID. Like that makes it worse. Don't do that. Right. Um, the medical facility is not doing their job. And, of course, if they hear this, they're going to argue with me because I'm, I was constantly on them about that. Right. You don't treat vulnerable, pop, vulnerable populations the way that they treat them just because they have a history. Some may have a history of trying to do this or that that others may not agree with. Doesn't deny them the right to effective medical assistance. Right. So And humanity. This they right. shouldn't be treated inhumane for it. I just it's very agree. frustrating because she didn't know she wasn't supposed to take ibuprofen. I said that just make it worse. Luckily she's young and she's thin, you know, she's healthy. But I was like, you have to tell the other women that ibuprofen is not Tylenol is okay. I I wait, wait, I'm sorry. I don't remember if Tylenol is okay. But I know ibuprofen is not okay. So 
um, I told her, you have to tell the other women that you can't be taking that. You need to check that nurse because that gave me a hard time when I asked her for medication that didn't affect my stomach. Right. And she, she wanted to give me the wrong medication. And when I refused, they tried to write me up for not taking my own medication. I'm a human being. If I refuse medication, I can refuse medication. Right. That's so, another area that um, that a lot of facilities report issues in is in the medical. Something else they're also giving money for. So, you know, right. when I hear about them skimping on pills or, or, you know, just doing anything that doesn't go how it should be, it always goes right back to that to that same question where's the money going if not where it's supposed to go it's not going to it's not going to the incarcerated people not even a little bit there were times when we we couldn't even get um sanitary napkins because they said oh this is not the week so they would give us uh state issues every friday friday night saturday morning and i would i would use the sanitary napkins to clean my floor because they're like swiffers i mean you have to be creative in there right but they wouldn't even they would they would tell us you're not going to get them for two weeks nobody has their period on time you know what i mean so people would go without because they didn't want to give the things that they were that they were they're in charge of giving that they have money for so i didn't understand why people were unable to get the things that they need that are supposed to be state issued items you know so that means that would mean soap that would mean toothpaste that would mean toilet paper that mean sanitary napkins uh, state issued underwear, disposable ones. Like we always had a difficult time asking for that those things. So, what are you doing with the money? You're clearly right. not cleaning the cells with the money. You're clearly right. not keeping up with the cleanliness in light of a, a, a worldwide pandemic. But not only that, I mean that's frustrating enough. But not only that, like uh, medic medic medical was inadequate. You know, um, we had to fight for what we felt we deserve to have as individuals as far as medical goes um and when people don't know how to advocate for themselves they don't know what to say or do so i, I had to tell a lot, a, a lot of the women a lot of times you know this is the process this is what you need to say this is how you document this is how you make sure that these things get taken care of i still have all of my grievances a grievance is and they and that's another thing that got to me i wasn't I wasn't aggrieving anything, but I was requesting things, but they call it a grievance. Like it's a negative connotation. I'm not arguing with nobody. If I want something, I would like to ask for it on a proper piece of paper. Right. But I kept all of my grievances. Like I asked for a power of attorney. They said they did, it took them 15 days to tell me they didn't know what a power of attorney was. What? Wow. Okay. You know, so I asked them for um, a preliminary hearing. They said I would have to talk to my my um my public defender. My public defender would never get back to me. I, my celly has been in there for two months and has not gone to court, not once. Mm-hmm. She doesn't know what her bond is because she doesn't have a bond right now. So like these are things aside from the pandemic. But if they're not even following the basic things, why would they follow the rules for a pandemic or CDC rules for a pandemic? Right. So. And then um, I had found out that Mississippi in mid-October was mandated to have masks on everybody in correctional facilities. Mm-hmm. We didn't have them. We weren't allowed to wear them. I had mm-hmm. one. We weren't allowed to re- wear them. And I couldn't replace it because I wouldn't even know who to ask to right. get it replaced if I did wear it. So, mm-hmm. and I would get written up. Wow. I, huh, I'm i like flabbergasted, you know what I mean? Um I hear these type of things all the time, but they never, they never lose their shock value. You know, it's just it's incredible and unacceptable how these facilities are treating human beings because they're not in the spotlight and they feel like you know no one's paying attention. Um, right. I do want to. Um, I'm not going to hold you too much longer, but um, I want to thank you again for, you know, being brave enough to speak with us about these things that's going on. That's how we hope to combat them is bringing attention and awareness, you know, to these situations, most definitely. Um, right. Before I let you go, is there anything else that you would um, you would like to say or put out there? Um, yeah, I would like to say that I think we need to remember that people are innocent until proven guilty. And oftentimes we hear um, somebody has been arrested for X, Y, Z and they're like, good, they should bury them under the jail or whatever. I feel like 
honestly, we need to really check ourselves because any of us could be in that situation. I never expected that for myself, and there I was. Mm -hmm. Although all my charges were dismissed because, you know, lack of evidence, lack of witnesses, it's still, you know, there's some people who felt that I was guilty before I was found innocent. Mm-hmm. even though I was innocent. Right. So I just want to caution people to not pass judgment so quick because you don't know the circumstances that bring people to, to um, bring people into um, correctional mm-hmm. facilities. You mm-hmm. don't know what happened prior. No one wakes up and says, hey, I think I want to commit a crime today or I want to go against the law. And as a matter of fact, many of us have committed crimes that we've never gotten caught for. So mm-hmm. there needs to be a little bit of understanding nationally, globally, that not everybody who is incarcerated is guilty. And if they are, what are the factors behind that? I think we need to start having that conversation. I agree with you 100% there, 110%. Again, I definitely appreciate you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you too.